Hello, I am Dr. Lawrence Smith, Dean of the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Thank you for tuning in to Well Said. In a culture of community, scholarship, and innovation, the Zucker School of Medicine is dedicated to transforming students into doctors who will improve healthcare, inspire change, and better the lives of the people they serve. It is why we are pleased to collaborate with WRHU, Radio Hofstra University, to bring you a program committed to sharing expert discussion and insight on health and wellness topics important to you. Join us today and each week for a recommended dose of Well Said with your host, Dr. Ira Nash. Hello, I'm Dr. Ira Nash. Welcome to Well Said. Today, we'll be discussing egg freezing, which has gained popularity in the past few years as a way for women to preserve their fertility until they feel ready to start a family. The technique has gotten safer and more affordable for patients, but many still have questions about the procedure and whether it's right for them. To help address these questions, I'm delighted to have on our show, Dr. Christine Mullen. Dr. Mullen is the Chief of Northwell Health Fertility and an Assistant Professor at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Christine, welcome to Well Said. Thank you for having me today. Before we get started talking about egg freezing and your particular area of expertise, I can't let the fact that we're now two years into a pandemic go past without first asking how you've been managing. Well, thank you for asking. We've actually adapted really well to the COVID pandemic, and it actually has improved the way that we care for our patients. A lot of our patients are are working women who have to come to our office before or after work and hustling back and forth, and really the utilization of telehealth has helped make those appointments more uh, attainable um, and has drastically uh, decreased the stress of getting to our office. So let's get into the whole world of egg freezing. Maybe we should start by just defining terms. So what exactly do you mean when you say egg freezing? Egg freezing is basically capitalizing on the woman's cohort of eggs that they produce each month and allowing women to save those eggs or freezing them for future use. Why don't you walk us through the process? The actual egg freezing process only takes about two weeks, which most people are surprised. The initial consultation is done by a physician in either in our office or via telehealth. And then we typically start the egg freezing process on the woman's second day of her menstrual cycle. They self-administer infertility uh, fertility drugs that for about 10 days. They're done these injections at home, and they're small needles that go under the skin. In that 10-day period, the patients come in about every other day for monitoring in the morning. And then once the eggs are the right size based on their sonogram and blood work, we give them their final trigger shot. And about 34 to 35 hours later, they undergo a procedure, which is about a 10-minute procedure in our office under mild sedation. They're not intubated. And we extract their eggs through a a transvaginal ultrasound. And then we freeze them about an hour later. And then they're there for them to use if they need it in the future. These drugs that the women self-administer at home, these are designed to stimulate more than the normal production of eggs? Absolutely. So the body only gives us about enough hormones to stimulate one mature egg uh, every month. And so what is sort of a misconception is that we lose one egg each month, but we actually lose a whole cohort of eggs. So the medications that we give are the, the body's own hormones on higher doses so we can make that whole cohort usable eggs or what we call mature eggs. And how many eggs do you hope to harvest at each turn? We try to aim for about 12 to 15 eggs in each cycle for each woman. It it can vary from person to person, depending on their age or their ovarian reserve testing that we do in the office. These drugs that stimulate the maturation of this larger number of eggs, do those have any kind of unpleasant or dangerous side effects for the woman who's undergoing this procedure? The biggest side effect of those medications is something called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. It's when your ovaries get enlarged due to the um, injectable hormones. It's usually self-limiting, but people can experience in that 10-day period some abdominal pain, bloating, and some nausea, but most patients do very well, um, and it resolves usually within a week after the retrieval. And you said that the women are closely monitored during this period that they're undergoing this uh, hormone treatment. Is that right? Absolutely. We see them about five to six times in about 10 to 12-day period, so we're monitoring them pretty closely to avoid this. 
you said that you're looking mostly with ultrasound, is that correct? Yep, everyone gets a transvaginal ultrasound and blood work. So the ultrasound measures the size of the follicles, and based on research and decades of doing this, we know that when the size of the follicle gets to a certain size, the egg inside is mature. And the follicle is something like an outgrowth on the ovary where the eggs mature, is that correct? Yeah, we sort of describe it as like a water-filled cavity that holds the egg. Tell me a little bit more about the retrieval process. That didn't sound too straightforward. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's, it's a same-day surgery or procedure. It's done in our office. Uh, there is an anesthesiologist there. They give you medication in an IV medicine that goes through your vein. Um, you're not intubated, so nothing goes down your mouth. It's just like a, like a sleep or a twilight. Um, and uh-huh. it's the same sonogram that we do in the office when we're monitoring you, but this time there's a needle attached, and the needle um, just transverses or goes through the vaginal wall into the ovary and sucks out or aspirates out the eggs into uh, the dish, and that's when we freeze them an hour later. So you're not actually following the same pathway that the egg would normally follow down the fallopian tubes and into the uterus. You're actually going through the uterus into directly into the ovaries. Correct. We're not going through the tube. We're actually just putting the ovary as close to the vaginal wall as possible and piercing through the vaginal wall into the ovary, almost like if you were to get your blood drawn at a blood drawing station, but this time we're doing it into the ovary. And then so you aspirate or suck out a small amount of fluid with the eggs in them, and then what, pop them in the freezer? We have trained embryologists in our lab that carefully What they do is denude or they take off the outer cell of the egg and then they freeze the eggs individually with a process called vitrification. Um, And it's a very delicate procedure that's done by a very experienced embryologist. Why is that so important? Because the freezing and thawing process is very delicate because the egg, unlike an embryo, is a water-filled organism. So the embryo has more cells, but the egg is just one cell, and it's very delicate. So it has to be, um, it's a very delicate, careful process that occurs in our office because if, if it's not done properly, then the eggs won't survive the freeze and the thawing when you use it later on. And you described some of the potential effects of the hormones that are used to stimulate the woman's egg production. Are there Other risks associated with this retrieval process? Uh, Yes. So there's always a risk um, because we're putting a needle into a vascular organ of bleeding and infection. Um, It's very rare um, because we do it under ultrasound guidance, and we give the patients antibiotics before uh, the procedure. So it's a very uncommon complication. Do you have any idea nationally how common this has now become? When we first started in like 2008, maybe they did like 500 cases, and now we're in like the tens to hundred thousands of cases worldwide and nationwide. Wow. So not really rare. Not rare at all. all. It's, It's a growing practice. Obviously, this is something that I guess most commonly is used by women who are concerned about their future fertility. But that's not all age-related, right? I mean, there there are other reasons why women may want to have their eggs frozen. Absolutely. There's a large portion of women who are just not ready um, to commit to having a family but want to preserve their fertility for the future by freezing their eggs. And there's a small subset of women that unfortunately are diagnosed with different either chronic or acute diseases that they're at risk for losing their fertility from medications, radiation, or surgery. So this is just a way to kind of get them through a difficult period when they're under treatment for something else and maybe subject to treatments that would interfere with their ability to uh, have a child. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Do you have sort of guidelines that you use for for women who are not in that, you know, serious illness category, but are more concerned about their, their age or, you know, they haven't, for whatever reason, they haven't decided that they're ready to have a family. What, what do you counsel them beforehand about whether this is a good idea for them? What kinds of questions do you ask? What sort of information do you provide? Typically, we talk about if, you know, basically if children are at the top of their list and they don't have them yet, but, you know, they want to take a little bit more proactive in their future and they're just not sure where their future is going, like this gives them empowerment to sort of control their reproductive destiny and do something for themselves. 
I always stress that it's not a guarantee that freezing their eggs will lead to, you know, a live birth, but it's something that they can do for themselves and have more of a reproductive autonomy in the future. You know, we, I use this egg freezing tool that most of my patients, I have them download from an app called MD Calc, where they can sort of see as they go through what the chances of getting pregnant would be from freezing their eggs at their at particular age. Do you have a cutoff? If somebody came to you and they were 25, you know, would you say too soon or no. how, how do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, we take each case scenario individually, but, you know, there were medical reasons where we did it under 18, and we've done many women in their 20s and 30s. ASRM actually says that that's the best time to freeze your eggs in your late 20s and early 30s, uh, especially if uh, you don't have an option for um, family building at the time. That age range is based on what? The age is based on natural fertility. Uh, a long time ago, there was a study with the Huterites that they look at natural fertility and the decline of natural fertility just based on females' age. And so you're saying you get, I hate to put it this way, but better eggs if you do it when a woman is in the age range that you cited? In terms of when's the best time to freeze your eggs, it's really typically in your late 20s or early 30s. We do have women that freeze their eggs at earlier ages due to medical conditions or comorbidities, but that's typically the best age. We do have women who are older in their early 30s. They typically are in their late 30s, early 40s, but we, we're pretty upfront and honest of what their prognosis is in terms of those eggs leading to a live birth. And that's just because the eggs themselves uh, are more likely to be successfully fertilized if they're coming from a woman who's younger than older. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Walk us through the process. So now somebody's got eggs frozen and decides uh, circumstances have changed and now uh, she wants to start a family. What's the process for taking those frozen eggs and helping a woman get pregnant? That process is I just tell the patients when you're ready to come back, just give us a call. And then we set up a, sort of a mock cycle to make sure that they're the lining of the uterus can thicken up with uh, oral medications called estrace. Um, and then it's just a process of making sure the partner or the donor sperm that they're picking um, has motile sperm. And then we set up a time to thaw the eggs out. They undergo a fertilization process in our lab called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, or we call it ICSI. Um, and then we grow the eggs out. Uh, the embryos out for five days and pick the best looking embryo under the microscope before we transfer it back. The embryo transfer is basically described as like a pap smear like exam um, where we though gently place the embryo in a certain spot of the uterus under ultrasound guidance. So you're actually fertilizing these eggs outside the woman's body waiting for them to grow a little bit so that you can check their viability and, and other things and, and then implanting them back into the woman. That's correct. Are you doing uh, genetic testing on those embryos? So some women opt to do the genetic testing depending on what age they froze their eggs. Um, the genetic testing, which is called pre-implantation genetic testing, is done five and six days after the egg is thawed out. And then a bunch of cells, like five to ten cells, are sent to an outside lab to test to make sure that the embryo is genetically normal. So we look at all the chromosomes to make sure they have two pairs of chromosomes, one from their mom, one from their dad, for all 22 autosome chromosomes and the sex chromosomes. So you can also choose to implant male embryos or female embryos? That's correct. So it also checks the gender, and some patients desire to choose, but I would say the majority of patients, they pick the best one. At best meaning what? Morphologically the best one, the one that looks the best under the microscope, and the one that has the correct number of chromosomes. So we grade them before we freeze them, like A, B, and C, based on their appearance under the microscope. And the embryologists are really good at picking out what, which one looks the best one. And that's all related to best correlating with most likely to develop into a healthy pregnancy. Correct. Yeah. How many embryos do you typically implant after this process? 
So the majority of times we put in one embryo at a time. There are rare occasions that we put more than one in, but I would say nine out of ten times we put one embryo in at a time. That's interesting because, I mean, I'm surprised to hear you say that because I was certainly under the misconception, no pun intended, yeah. uh, that, <laughs> um, that multiple embryos were typically implanted, and that's why you see so many people with twins and, and multiple. multiple births. Yeah, so there is a, a major misconception, and often we get patients that come in wanting twins, um, but actually the twin... Uh, you know, by the ASRM guidelines, the recommendation is to put one embryo in at a time. And thank goodness from the, the advances in technology in our field, we've been able to get better pregnancy rates with doing just a one embryo transfer. Um, and so now, since like 2011, one embryo transfer has been more the standard and the norm. And there are some you know, special occasions where patients will get more than one embryo placed back, but in the majority of cases, it's one. And the chance of pre uh, twin pregnancy with one embryo transfer is like less than 1%. Right, because that would be the embryo itself kind Head of dividing split. into two. Overall, I know it's probably different for different subsets of women, but overall, what's the success rate starting from freezing eggs to healthy baby. I like to use this calculator, this algorithm, and it's a mathematical model that is used, but it really depends on the patient's age and the number of eggs. So, for example, if you come in and you're less than 35 years of age and you are able to get 12 eggs frozen, your chance of pregnancy is more like 70-80%, whereas if you are over 35, that, that chance of pregnancy may be cut in half with the same number of eggs. And that may take more than one cycle of fertilization and implantation too, right? Right. And most women will do more than one cycle. Um, they use the calculator to sort of determine what chance of pregnancy they want before moving on. I'm not sure I understand. So cycle of harvesting or cycle of fertilization and implantation? Cycle of harvesting. So, oh, okay. for example, a patient may come in who's 40 years of age and get six eggs and may only have a chance of pregnancy of 25% with those eggs, and that might not be acceptable. And so let me try the harvesting portion of this again to get another batch of six, which will increase my chance of live birth. I see. Okay. Whereas then, a 25-year-old may get 20 eggs and have an 85% chance of live birth and say, I'm only going to do this once. Got it. Once they have sort of a favorable number of eggs, do you find that it takes more than one cycle of fertilization and implantation often to, to get to a viable pregnancy? So most patients, um, we typically thaw out all the eggs at once and fertilize them all at once, um, and then we do the transfer. And most people will be pregnant in the first uh, two transfers. Oh, so it's not like you're thawing these one at a time and fertilizing them and then... No. Uh, oh, interesting. Because I, there's always guess... an attrition rate. So if you have 10 eggs, maybe only eight survive the thaw, and maybe of the eight, only five fertilize. And then when you grow those five out for five days in the lab, potentially only two or three will make it to day five. So we typically sort of go on the notion of if you have 10 eggs, 10 eggs usually equals about two embryos because of the attrition or the sort of like survival of the fittest in the lab. And I guess that gets back to what you were saying before, then if you add in testing on those embryos and picking the Correct. best one, right, then, then you're, you're down to even uh, lower numbers. Absolutely. This all sounds pretty um, high-tech and, frankly, possibly pretty expensive. Is this the kind of thing that um, health insurance typically covers? Well, most insurances cover the procedure called IVF, but there are a few that cover the egg freezing process. We're lucky here at Northwell um, that our insurance does cover the egg freezing process, but if your insurance doesn't cover it, women can spend somewhere between $15,000 and $20,000 for a cycle wow. of freezing their eggs. Well, wow. and I imagine that the longer you keep them frozen, the more expensive it gets. Is that true? Yes, there's a yearly storage fee, and it can range from center to center, but typically the the range of cost is between $800 and $1,200 per year for storage of this tissue. 
does the likelihood of a um, successful fertilization in, in pregnancy go down based on how long they've been frozen? Actually, no, there hasn't been any studies to show that. <laughs> so, so once they're frozen, they're literally like in suspended animation and, and you don't lose anything over time. Exactly. Okay, well, I, I guess that's the whole point of doing this. Mm-hmm. Do you find that women are more open to the idea of this than, than they once were? Like, where, where do you see this in kind of the thinking of, of women about their own fertility and, and family planning? I think it's become more of a narrative and a, you know, a journey. Um, I think people are more open to talking about it on social media and in the public, that people are more accepting uh, before Fertility was more of a stigma that no one talked about, and you sort of suffered in silence. But I think more people are open to um, talking about it. So I think the sort of the stigma of fertility and, or infertility has sort of changed. The narrative has changed. It's been more commonly spoken about in social media, on TV. People are coming out more often to talk about their fertility journals. So I think it's more acceptable to people to sort of take control of their own fertility using the egg freezing process. And do you think there's still some stigma about this or lack of awareness? I think sometimes when um, women come in, there's still education, that continuous education that has to occur because there still are misconceptions out there and women come in thinking that maybe they can be pregnant later in life with their own eggs. Um, and that's always sort of... Um, a surprise to them sometimes when they come in um, that that's not the case. So it's just a matter of continually to communicate and educate to the to the public and uh, through avenues now that we have with social media, Instagram, TikTok, to get the word out about natural fertility and options for uh, women. So what do you think some of those key messages that you'd like to get out are? I mean, here's your chance right now. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess my advice would be, like, if you're in your late 20s or early 30s and if you're thinking of children or building a family and that's one of your priorities in life and you just don't have the options yet at your hands, I would tell them that you really need to make this a priority for yourself and that egg freezing is an option for you to take more control of your reproductive destiny, um, to do something for yourself. and. While it's, it's not a guarantee that it'll lead to live birth, it's definitely something that will give you the opportunity at a chance for reproductive autonomy. So let me just push back, on, I guess, on that a little bit. So are, are you saying that a 30-year-old woman or a 32-year-old woman who is not ready to have a child yet should seriously consider egg freezing as opposed to just waiting for the chance to become pregnant in the more traditional way? Absolutely. So, you know, this is sort of a backup plan, right? So if at this point in their time and they're 32, 33, and they don't have um, what seems to be a, a, a near future option of having children, this is the backup plan. And once they do have that option, then we do encourage them to try to get pregnant the natural way with this, as they know, as their backup plan if it doesn't work. So we have a lot of women who come in at 40 years old who may have frozen their eggs at 32, 33, and they try on their own uh, initially, and if it doesn't work, they go back to the eggs that they froze years before. Mm -hmm. Just surprised uh, a little bit at the uh, the age at which you're you're saying this is uh, this makes sense, but I guess it goes back to what you said before that that's when the eggs are, are most likely to be of sufficient quality to have a high likelihood of success. Yeah. What's coming down the line in terms of this whole process? How do you see this field developing in the next few years? As our technology in the lab advances, I think you'll see a growing um, number of women being able to freeze their eggs without medication and doing the maturation of the eggs in the lab through a procedure called in vitro maturation, where the women don't have to do the medications, but would just come in and schedule their retrieval, and they would do the maturation of the eggs in the lab. And I think that'll cut down on costs in terms of medications and on um, visits. If there uh, are any young women who are listening to us right now and are thinking about this and want to get more information about it, where would you direct them to get some high-quality information? 
Sure. So they can always reach us at um, Northwell Fertility and call our office for a consultation. We can do it either via telehealth or in office at our 516-562-BABY number or other good patient information on site or online. You can visit our website at Northwell Fertility or also our society's website at American Society of Reproductive Medicine or Society of Assisted Reproductive Technology websites. Great. Any uh, final thoughts or messages for our listeners? No, I look forward to seeing everybody to help you with your future fertility. Well, thanks very much. It's been my pleasure to have Dr. Christine Mullen uh, join me today to talk about egg freezing and and some of the latest technology in assisted reproduction. Thank you for having me, Ira. For more information about this program and to find past episodes, please visit medicine.hofstra.edu slash well said. You can also subscribe to our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Our listeners are also welcome to send comments, suggestions, and questions to wellsaid at hostra.edu. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ira Nash, and that's Well Said. Well Said.